Good evening, everyone. I am Iris Bonnet. I'm the academic dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. It is with great pleasure that, on behalf of the president of the university and of the dean of the Kennedy School, I welcome you tonight here at the JFK Junior Forum. As many of you know, the JFK Junior Forum here at the Kennedy School is Harvard's premier arena for political speech, discussion, and debate. For almost 30 years, presidents and prime ministers, scientists and generals, candidates and ambassadors, artists and academics, and many, many more have delivered addresses and engaged in discourse here in this beautiful space. Before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge the Harvard Pakistan Student Group, Harvard South Asia Institute, and the Institute of Politics, which all make made this event possible. It's now my distinct honor to welcome our speaker for this evening, Ambassador Sherry Rahman, as well as our moderator, my colleague, Harvey Kennedy School Professor Megan O'Sullivan. Megan is an expert on international relations, international security, the Middle East, and energy, and she will introduce the ambassador more formally in just a moment. Harvard University is home to nearly 30 Pakistani students and welcomes the opportunity to hear tonight the ambassador's remarks on the evolving relationship between our two countries. We are extremely honored to have her as a guest here with us tonight. We thank you for your service and for taking the time to be with us here. But without further ado, let me turn over the floor to Megan O'Sullivan to offer some more formal remarks on the ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Ambassador Sherry Raymond here tonight and also my pleasure to introduce her to the forum and to all of you. She has been in her current position as ambassador, Pakistani ambassador to the United States since November 2011. And as such, she really embodies the bridge between these two countries. And this, of course, is a very critical bridge. As you well know, this is a difficult relationship, but a very consequential relationship. And I can think of really no other bilateral relationship that is in as great a need of having people who really understand both sides of the equation, and the ambassador is certainly someone who fits that bill very well. Beyond her current position, she comes to us tonight with a very distinguished career in public service. Before becoming ambassador, she was federal minister, she was chairperson of the Pakistani Red Crescent Society. In the past, she also was federal minister for information and a member of parliament uh, for two terms. And before that, she had 20 years of experience in journalism. Now, beyond these very distinguished positions, I would say there's something that I admire even more about her, and that is the vigor and the bravery she has shown in being an advocate for some of Pakistan's most controversial issues. She's been a very prominent and consistent voice uh, for repealing the blasphemy laws in Pakistan, and for the empowerment of women. She's been a very consistent voice for moderation in a country and in a space where there has been too much extremism. And she's done this in all of her capacities, as a journalist, as a chair of the Jinnah Institute, as a member of parliament, as a minister, and today as an ambassador. She's going to speak to us tonight about this very critical US-Pakistan relationship and the broader security challenges of the region. And I'm very pleased and honored she could join us. And please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Dear Dean Bonnet, Megan O'Sullivan, students, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and pleasure to be here with you tonight Thank you for organizing this and thank you for hosting this. I must also say that uh, it is an amazing opportunity to share what's on my mind uh, about the renewed and robust 
re-engagement between our two great countries as we enter this next year. Uh, it's also a particular privilege and pleasure to be at Harvard. Uh, its reputation as a center for academic excellence crosses all borders, but for me, its gravitational pull far exceeds the virtues of its public brand. For me and for many Pakistanis, in fact, it is the university that our first elected woman prime minister was very proud to be associated with. I start with Benazir Bhutto today because both Pakistan and I owe her a great debt of political and moral gratitude. My own personal story in the political mainstream in Pakistan began with her recruiting and mentoring so many young women at that time. I was one of them. But more importantly, the Pakistan we speak of today at a crossroads of history, struggling each day to move from a challenging past into a future she dreamed of, a Pakistan at peace with itself and at peace with the world, owes much of this new story to both her vision and her sacrifice. I mention her sacrifice particularly not because her memory needs to be burnished by it, but because her sacrifice against terrorism, her search for regional peace, and her battle for democracy remain Pakistan's three defining projects today. Every day we move towards institutions that buttress institutional democracy while we reshape our future in the region, and I will tell you a little bit more about that. And every day we fight extremism and terrorism with our lives in the trenches on the front lines. Without getting into a victim narrative, which strips us of agency and responsibility, I say this because perhaps it will help refract for some of you here the daily challenge that we face as we rebuild our country in the 30-year-old shadow of great conflicts in the region from the violence and alien extremisms that came with them. Why do I bring history to the table on a discussion on our bilateral future post-2014? Because history is the path to two crucial elements in the terrain between the United States and Pakistan. It is the, lo it is the lost space where many forgotten dots between cause and effect reappear, casting a light on some understanding uh, in the fog of war, and it is also a place where we build a strategic playbook of lessons learned for the future. Now I'll come back to that playbook shortly because my first task in this country uh, is to bridge the cognitive divide that has arisen over the decade, the last decade particularly, when we have since September 11 been allies in the battlefield. Although our two governments are working very closely together again, and I have to say that uh, this is a success since the, the time of crisis when I actually came here, when all doors were closed to re-engagement on both sides. It is not enough to dismiss this drift as a misunderstanding of our strategic motive and move it to the dustbin of the cliched trust deficit. Everything kind of seems just to be put in that, and, and that would be intellectually lazy of me. Um, if we are to move forward in lockstep to stabilize the region, which should be our fundamental joint goal, then we have to understand the better. Pakistan's first battlefield encounter with the United States in Afghanistan as allies against the Soviet Union informs the collective memory of my generation. That would be the 50-somethings. Okay, so 52. Now for us, before the 1979 war as it came to be known, the concept of terrorism and militant extremisms were quite alien. In fact, before this last, uh, before 2001, we only knew of one suicide bombing. Now we see one, more than one every day. And the drugs, guns, and terrorist triad that we saw suddenly by the 1980s when I became an editor was the blowback we were left from an outsourced war in Afghanistan. It was an outsourced war, and it felt like one. This is not to say that our own mistakes were not legion. They contributed to how we contained the fallout then, and it is important to understand from them today. But I have to say that even if we had somehow crafted and executed the best of policies, the porous border with Afghanistan and what was left behind there 
left Pakistan awash with the world's largest population of refugees, among the many other things I've described to you, we still host them today. And I'm not talking about the numbers that the UN speaks about. They are the forgotten statistic from that war. But for us, they are the new and living demographic that we live with in our streets and in the warrens of our villages and towns. They too will shape how we deal with 2014. Now the 30-somethings generation of Pakistanis has a quite different perception of the United States and this is important to understand. They did not see Tarbela Dam being built by the US. This would be the largest rock pill dam in the world. They did not see um, many things happening. They did not see President Kennedy and uh, arriving in the streets of Pakistan, too many flags and accolades. Nor did they benefit from the opportunities of scholarships open to middle class Pakistanis to go to schools such as Smith College and Harvard University. I went to Smith and I'm going there tomorrow. Um, they see Muslim discontent in the Middle East. They see drone attacks on 40 plus television channels every time there is such an attack. And you know, they can be quite frequent. Uh, this is how they see America projecting power abroad. They hate the terrorists that rip through our schools and hospitals and Sufi shrines and our government buildings and ask our government and parliament why pa Pakistan has often asked to do more. Every time there's an IED attack in Afghanistan or Kabul uh, because we sustain more IED attacks than everybody joined together or why 46,000 of our citizens and soldiers since 2002 who have been killed don't count enough? They ask many such questions, but still, still, most Pakistanis defy the polls that you hear about that tell you of mass anti-Americanism and understand, they really do understand, that the United States still seeks to be an ally and a friend, especially the people of the United States. Most Pakistanis, let me tell you, vote for peace, for moderation, for stability, for jobs, for an education, for safer streets, for access to health care, better governance, all the same things that people vote for everywhere in their, in their lives in the world to seek a better life for themselves and for their children when they look to self-government. And they do see in Pakistan the American people as an important global advocate for reform and partnership. Contrary to what you see in the headlines, most Pakistanis are not extremists. That is why demogra uh, democratic governments now pivot very sharply for a diplomatic and trade surge in the region. This may be a new development, so I'm glad to talk to you about it. This new regional pivot, driven specifically by President Zardari of Pakistan, forms the fundamental bedrock of what is Pakistan's new strategic outreach as it seeks to shore up American gains next door and initiates and amplifies a diplomatic surge across the board in the region, both towards the east and the west of our borders. But we have to understand that this regional policy will only bring stability because that is the goal of this uh, and prosperity to the region if the US also plays its part and works through the end game of this longest war without too many unintended consequences this time. As I said earlier, both our countries were in two wars together next door. Both the United States and Pakistan actually won the first war if you can think back, but we lost the peace. The jury is still out on this one. I say this because a review of strategic setbacks and what caused them should be front and center of our lesson learned menu as we attempt the United States and Pakistan to stabilize the region together. So Pakistan and the US should have learned two important lessons from the first war, the first war in Afghanistan. One, terrorism must be unambiguously and systematically and sustainably defeated together. You can't approach it in episodes and you can't be distracted. True, two, the application of military force is never enough in a theater such as Afghanistan. 
I try very hard to resist the graveyard of empire cliches, but obviously I'm failing because it just rushes to the mind. Pakistan has certainly learned one important lesson, that no one can broker a sustainable peace in Afghanistan except the Afghans themselves. Therefore, Pakistan fully supports an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned process of reconciliation and peace. Today, let me emphasize that it is our considered coordinated interagency policy that Afghans have to lead the process for peace in Afghanistan. No one else can do that. Pakistan will support all roadmaps for a nego negotiated settlement of this war. What we will not do is support any particular group or play any favorites. Let me say very unequivocally that the government and state of Pakistan do not see Afghanistan as our strategic backyard. We hope that the important gains by the, made by the U.S. and NATO forces can be protected, especially in terms of fundamental freedoms for women and for access to social services and for all the development work that civil society and others have managed to do in parts of large swathes of Afghanistan. We want to see Afghanistan as a united, independent, and sovereign state. We urge all concerned to join the reconciliation process because we recognize that Pakistan has vital stakes in a peaceful, self-ruled Afghanistan. Remember that long 2,400 kilometers porous border. We also recognize that the road ahead is full of challenges, but our goal is to be diligent in our search for clarity and convergence among our three nations. And I have to say at this point that even when formal ties were suspended when I was sent here to Washington, we did keep what is known as the trilateral process absolutely going between our three countries uh, because we know that timelines are fast approaching in terms of drawdowns and uh, the Afghan state is in clearly in need of friends and in need of assistance. We understand the, all the U.S. compulsions relating to under, Afghanistan. We know that there is a timeline, there's a drawdown, and it's often driven by domestic uh, exigencies. We want to help the U.S. to manage a smooth and responsible transition in Afghanistan simply because we would be the first victims of any security vacuum that arises as the transition takes place or the transfer of security responsibilities is incomplete. To that end, we would like the United States to lay down the foundations for Afghanistan's future political and economic stability. This is clearly in Pakistan's self-interest and, of course, Afghanistan's. I cannot re-emphasize more that peace in my Pakistan is impossible without peace or some modicum of it in Afghanistan. We all know that the U.S. hopes to conclude the war in Afghanistan soon, uh, say 2014, and that date keeps looming large over policy discourse in, in Washington and in many capitals of the world today. There is deep concern over whether the U.S. will be able to leave a reasonably stable Afghanistan behind or if the blood and treasure invested over the course of a decade will yield not any serious tangible results. And in the absence of a decisive victory in Afghanistan, um, we have to be careful. If the United States approaches the timelines to 2014 uh, with those lessons learned, with a view to history, with a view to supporting the region, and we believe, of course, that they will, you will forgive me for saying that the mood in Pakistan is, is certainly informed by a calendar of imminent anxieties. I'm sorry that memory remains such a tangible ghost at the bilateral table, but there is very good reason for that. And I'm just going to quote Secretary Clinton, um, what she told Congress in 2009, and I quote, the people we are fighting today, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. We then left Pakistan. We said, okay, fine, you deal with the stingers and you deal with the mines along the border. And by the way, we don't want to be dealing with you. And in fact, we are sanctioning you, unquote. You can all understand just how crucial it is that the principal actors in this fight, the United States, Pakistan, and the Afghanistan, get it right this time round.
So we're all in this together, we hope, uh, and we expect to work together. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan cannot afford a repeat of the 1990s. If anyone else can, we cannot. When the Soviet withdrawal led to the same American withdrawal and Afghanistan sank into a devastating internecine conflict. We hope the international community can see a clear learning curve through this and rethink their approach to the region. We certainly have. Afghanistan is entitled to the same consideration and respect from us that we expect for ourselves. We do not wish to impose a government in Afghanistan or work with only selected partners. Afghanistan is our neighbor, not our sphere of influence. I say this repeatedly because clearly it is a lesson learned. Here again, I must underscore that we have the most to gain from a prosperous and peaceful Afghanistan. Despite our difficult economic circumstances, Pakistan has invested $300 million just recently in Afghanistan's infrastructure as a sign of our goodwill. We have revised and upgraded the 50-year-old transit trade agreement with Afghanistan to bring it more in line with contemporary realities and needs. Afghan trucks will now be able to travel across Pakistan all the way to the Pakistan-India border. Our regional pivot also focuses on bringing down an architecture of trade barriers built over the last 60 years, both with India, between India and Pakistan, and of course, we are pretty much on course despite flare-ups on the line of control that you, you might have heard recently in Kashmir to forge ahead with building investments in peace, trade, economic integration, and opportunities for our huge youth cohort in South Asia, particularly in Pakistan. A dialogue at multiple levels is also underway. Pakistan's cabinet is considering extending most favored nation status to India while pressing India to dismantle its tariff and non-tariff barriers, para-tariff barriers to Pakistan's exports. The two countries recently agreed on an expanded visa agreement. Some experts see bilateral trade touching seven to eight billion dollars within a couple of years. Our textile stores are opening up in their capital and vice versa. Our banks are opening up in each other's countries. This is the great untold story of the region, but um, I have a lot of ground to cover and we can address this later. Pakistan is also moving fast to connect with countries in Central Asia. We are working on the Turkmenistan-Afghanistan-Pakistan pipeline and hopefully the India gas pipeline. We hope to also see progress on the CASA initiative. Above all, above all, Pakistan is now a democracy. For the first time in our history, an elected government is set to complete its full constitutional term peacefully. A caretaker government will soon be in place. Elections will follow in a maximum time frame of 90 days, and these will be supervised by an autonomous election commission already in place, appointed by a multi-partisan committee uh, of all parliamentary parties. So we have made everyone, every political stakeholder, uh, a partner in this very important appointment. We are all held accountable every day by an independent and raucous media while the president has devolved his powers to the head of parliament, which would be the prime minister. Leadership is being feminized proactively, which is why you're stuck with me as ambassador, uh, and <laughs> anti-poverty programs target women at the bottom of the pyramid, already reaching 18% of our population, uh, delivering services that have never been delivered in Pakistan. I would rate this as the single biggest reason for a solid and productive, sustainable bilateral relationship post-2014. The two countries, Pakistan and the United States, have been bound by geopolitical compulsions in the past, but these associations have proved transactional at best and brittle and unsustainable at worst. It is time that we allowed the bond of shared democratic values and ideals to work their weight. I'm certain the results will be to our collective benefit. So what can Pakistan and the United States do in the lead up to 2014 to prevent a repeat of history? I would venture to make a few suggestions. One, trust each other. Share notes, build communication through formal channels, not the media. Coercive diplomacy through the media 
is not the way forward in Pakistan. It will not work. Two, show some strategic sympathy. Try to understand each other's challenges. Don't interpret differences of approach as duplicity. Don't confuse capacity issues as lack of will. Things are different in Pakistan. Do not exacerbate each other's sense of insecurity or anxiety. When we have schoolgirls like Malala Yousafzai, and you may all have heard of her, shot by TTP terrorists, massing, critically massing, in the province of Kunar and the areas of Paktika, which used to be regional command east only, what, a, less than a year ago, on the Afghan side of the border, we do not leap to the public conclusion that this was either deliberate or planned, notwithstanding conspiracy theorists in our vernacular press or the fog of war again. We expect the same consideration. We need to talk issues through, and we try to do that. Three, recognize that the problems in Afghanistan are multidimensional and require the same complex solutions. Pakistan has been making this point since the first year the United States was involved in Afghanistan in this last decade. Force is, of course, an important element. It is, however, only one of many and not always entirely successful. There has to be an equal emphasis on a political solution. I personally feel that in a functioning state, uh, and I think that is the way Pakistan is uh, thinking about its own self, the use of force or the monopoly of the use of force has to remain with the state. But the way things are organized in Afghanistan right now, uh, we need to understand that force has not worked. Well, it hasn't. So the more people and groups the U.S. can bring into the reconciliation tent and be there to secure some of that peace, to ensure constitutional guarantees for the human rights and women, the better it would be. No one who is disposed to talk should find the road too difficult or the door too tightly shut. Uh, so we are glad to see emphasis on talking now. Uh, and we believe the phrase better late than never applies here, although timelines do matter. It's when you talk uh, along your drawdown or surge timeline that matters. Four, let's do a reality check on the situation in Afghanistan. Do not go crashing out in an exit that runs the risk of sinking Afghanistan into instability and economic unsustainability. More than a military victory, what the U.S. must now try to ensure is to leave an economic infrastructure behind that allows the Afghans to build on after the United States leaves. After fighting the war, the United States, and we are willing to work with them, with our partners, must win the peace. This is the more difficult, onerous challenge. We will work with you on it, and I believe we are. Five, there needs to be a robust anti-narcotics element to the U.S. ISAF activities and even their charter. It still isn't run in, written in even after drawdown, even while we see drawdown. Unfortunately, a great deal of time has been lost, and this seemingly ancillary issue can threaten and upend many of the gains made over the last decade. According to a United Nations report, the acreage devoted to poppy cultivation in Afghanistan is increased, increased by 18% only in the last year. So it's going up. What does that tell you? This tells us that we have cause to worry. An immediate result of such an uptick in poppy cultivation will give Afghan insurgents more funds to continue their opposition to the United States and to the government in Kabul. If I was an insurgent or a terrorist, I would become more intransigent in my demands, wouldn't I? So, a longer ter term casualty would this, of this would be Afghanistan's post-2014 stability. Narcotics interdiction has to be written in into any international agreements. Six, we tell each other and we tell ourselves more, know the limits of our reach and capacity in Afghanistan. Both sides should understand this because we cannot be expected to deliver stability in an arena where more than 40 countries and billions of dollars could not. So now don't start asking Pakistan to deliver it. 
We are not the coalition of the unwilling. We are invested more than anybody in Afghan stability and regional peace and prosperity. Know that we spend $5 billion, just a little bit more than that on defense, while the United States spends $2 billion a week just in Afghanistan. So just a bit of perspective. The glass must be seen as half full when we do, when we conduct, for instance, counter IED operations with uh, joint forces all the time, not half empty. Uh, we are able to interdict over 99% of, I'm just going to be technical here, the calcium ammonium nitrate. It's called CAN, and it's the reason for legislation in Congress, so you might want to know about it. It's the precursor that goes into IED, bomb making, in Afghanistan. Pakistan interdicts 99% of it on record, as the United States gyro departments know. However, we are often told that glass is half empty. So this discourages the kind of tough fight we are on in the front lines. However, we are committed, and as I said, as we speak, we have a working group sitting in Washington, which I shall go back to very soon, uh, to work with on these same ends. Seven, stabilize and moderate the United States footprint in Pakistan. Enough said. Eight, work with the societies and peoples of our two nations. Expand the opportunities for travel, investment, trade, interaction, communication. And we are on the path to that, but clearly not enough. Nine, make trade the highway to our future, not necessarily aid. I'm not sitting here saying, uh, uh, saying that, well, you know, Pakistan has not been grateful for the aid that way, but let me put it in perspective. We have lost $78 billion. That is not, that is an I, you know, IMF World Bank account, not my own, in the last 10 years. Uh, and a lot of the aid coming our way is usually coalition support funds. A lot of the Kerry Luger Berman dispensation uh, that does come through, I think only less than, less than half of it actually makes its way to the government's treasury. We appreciate the spirit behind it, and we would like to work together to build on equities of trade and peace together. <laughs> Lastly, 10, do not see as a, us as a function of, of Afghanistan. Let's build on a common future together and find common ground. So enough of looking back. I believe Pakistan and the United States provide the relationship today provides an important opportunity for an exercise in foresight. We are looking forward rather than backward. 2014 is certainly important. Everybody in Washington wants to talk about it. However, let me assure you, at least for us, history will not end in 2014. Pakistan hopes to be a valuable friend and partner of the United States beyond that important milestone. I'm sure there'll be many others. And I just want to take the time to, you know I'm a parliamentarian, you give me a mic, it's very hard to contain me. <laughs> Pakistan is the world's sixth largest country and the second biggest Muslim country in the world right now. With a median age of 21.5 years, Pakistan is among the world's 20 youngest countries and the biggest in that group. Uh, we have a mo upwardly mobile middle class, technologically savvy, biggest outside only of China and India, uh, very historically consumption oriented, so one of the markets right now in Asia. We have the ninth largest pool of English language speakers and one of the biggest trained workforces in the world. We are the largest UN peacekeeper in the world right now. We are served by a competent bureaucracy and boast a fairly good network of universities and colleges of course, Pakistan is doing everything it can to invest in this youth cohort, but the results would be far better if the United States joined us in this important endeavor. There are scores of workers, professionals, entrepreneurs, music makers, scientists, artists, and consumers in this enormous pool of young people. This is the future. Properly equipped, they will lead Pakistan and contribute to the prosperity of our country, the new vision, the region, and the world. The relationship between the two countries, Pakistan and the United States, I'm happy to report, is back to a new but sober and stable and upward trajectory. 
Our working groups are engaged, uh, as I said, I speak, and a level of confidence is returning as the ground lines of communications. They're ridiculously known as GLOCKS. Um, both governments love acronyms and airlocks, which are the airlines of communications, as they have once again become the main artery for the NATO suppliers to go through and for the drawdown to commence. Uh, we have actually been through very quietly because people are, there was a, an election happening in this country. I don't know if people notice. Five working groups re-engaged again on energy, on uh, strategic stability, on counterterrorism, on economy, on law enforcement, either in Islamabad or Washington. So we've been very busy ferrying back and forth, resuming our strategic dialogue. But allow me to finish with what I think are the most important stories. They happen right here in rooms like this, and, and at a recent All World Network meeting, a gathering of Harvard's most successful and rising young entrepreneurs at Harvard Business School. Uh, this was arranged in collaboration with the State Department. Pakistani uh, participants constituted 30% of the total. The Pakistan 100, as they were called, uh, were defined by success stories of young Pakistanis who have excelled in business enterprises through their innovation, creativity, and very hard work. These companies from Pakistan achieved what was known as the all-world international standard for competitive fast growth by growing on average at 55% a year with the top ranking company registering an amazing 2,000% growth. So of course, yes, we can. My leader and mentor, Benazir Bhutto, always used to say, yes, you can. And I used to end a lot of speeches by saying, all it takes is a few good women, but I won't do that. All it takes is a few lot of us, like a few young people. I leave the rest to the young leadership in this room, and I'm happy to interact with you for as much as my chief of staff allows me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those thoughtful and comprehensive comments. Now we have the opportunity to ask the ambassador some questions. Uh, we will follow the rules of this forum. There are microphones here, here, and over here. Um, you're all probably very familiar with the three rules associated with asking a question. Please state your name and affiliation. Secondly, please make it brief, one thought per person. And finally, please end with a question mark. Um, so with that, I'll ask the ambassador to retake the stage, and we'll start over here, please. Hi, my name is Viral, and I'm a freshman. Um, this question is, is on behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. The first complete five-year term of democratic government in Pakistan will end this year. Could you please give some perspective on the upcoming election and transition? Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, well, I think the last days of uh, constitutionally of this government would be the elected government be would sometime middle of March. Uh, and after that, there will be a caretaker government in place that is our constitutionally mandated system to protect um, all parties uh, for a level playing field. So the, we don't have the joys and advantages of incumbency to weigh the advantage in the electoral field that will be a caretaker government for about 60 to 90 days. 90 days is their maximum time limit. They have to conduct elections with an independent election commission, which as I said, already in place with a respected juror. You might have heard of him, Fakhruddin G. Ibrahim, heading that show. Uh, and we expect to go into elections according to this particular time frame. I hope that answers some of your questions. The caretaker cabinet, incidentally, is not allowed to contest elections. Uh, so they are, they would be out of the race. Hi, um, my name is John. I am a junior at the college from Turkey, and I'm also from the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum, but I wanted to ask you the Twitter question because our viewers online can actually submit questions by tweeting at JFK Junior Forum. Uh, I know this is a sensitive topic, but um, do you think there is room for cooperation on drone strikes within Pakistan, between Pakistan and the U.S.? We would certainly like an end to drone strikes. Uh, we have a very clear and unambig uh, unambiguous position. We have stated again and again 
uh, that we consider them a violation of law and our sovereignty. Uh, and I think the best way forward would be a diplomatic engagement on how best to reduce uh, and, and end drone strikes. Um, this is not something that is acceptable to the people of Pakistan. I'm also saying that while they may be an important counterterrorism instrument, uh, you know, it's called precise uh, uh, and, and you, you know, it supposedly doesn't take troops in, put troops in harm's way what it does now is it sees a diminishing um, set of returns for the United States more than anyone else because we are very clearly committed to fighting Al-Qaeda, which was the stated goal, the stated policy goal of the United States when it entered Afghanistan. Uh, and you may have seen many now public interlocutors from the United States, including the uh, Ambassador Olson to Pakistan, stating in his uh, confirmation hearing that Pakistan has been the most important uh, partner in degrading, destroying, and eliminating Al-Qaeda. So yes, I think we have done that heavy lift with the United States. We appreciate finally that acknowledgement. Uh, and it certainly hasn't happened, come about through drone strikes. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Matthew. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, and I was, my, my question is about um, the arrest order against the former, against the Prime Minister uh, Raja Pervez Ashraf. And I was wondering um, if you could speak to your priorities um, as a government and as a party in reducing corruption, um, what the challenges have been and what you've um, accomplished. Certainly, thank you for that important question. We have as a government uh, been held to most account than any other government in Pakistan's living history. As you yourself acknowledged, we bowed to the judgments of our superior courts again and again, uh, losing, in fact, preferring to lose a prime minister than to defy the orders of the court. Uh, these are the kind of institutions we are investing in today. The Election Commission, for instance, of Pakistan was the once it was made, uh, was its first action was to throw out the ruling parties, one of our uh, candidates in a by-election. We have to accept the, their, their decisions and verdicts and understand that um, this is how uh, the institutions that will buttress future democracies and save them from any other interventions are going to work and this is important. Governance is extremely important. This whole term of the last government has been spent literally in bringing about unprecedented um, by consensus in parliament constitutional reform that was outstanding I would say for the last 25 years. We have devolved power both fiscal and real to the provinces uh, it is going to, including the social services, it is going to take them time to build that capacity. But this was a promise that we had made to the people of Pakistan. It is the initial contract we are moving towards, even if it strips our governments of power. It has to go this way to the grassroots. I mean, uh, democracy begins in at home, at the doorstep, quite literally. And as we go into the next election, we will be seeking to consolidate gains made through this important foundation of constitutional uh, and other reform. Most of our legislation actually has a, a great deal of women's protection, empowerment legislation, some of which I spearheaded as a member myself, have actually started to be implemented on the ground. We have found unlikely partners in the private media just picking it up, civil society picking up, um, uh, an infrastructure, creating one, posting um, for people perhaps who may not have an outreach to, to state uh, um, education programs or how their rights can be enforced uh, for say something like sexual harassment in the workplace or public place. There will be television channels including the state-owned channel running um, easy to digest and understand cartoons and little programs telling the citizens how they can actually 
reach uh, and make reach out and make these rights real for themselves because democracy is a two-way process you can enforce it and enforce it and enforce it it has to also um, um, filter up and I'm happy to report that with our civil society media courts other institutions now coming up to claim their place in the Sun it is a lively and very very vibrant democracy thank you Good evening, my name is Rabia Ahmed and I'm from Islamabad. I'm a junior at the college. And today I would like to talk about uh, the role that Pakistan has played in not curbing the genocide that's taking place in Hazara right now. Hundreds of people have uh, recently, the court, uh, the Chief Justice talked about how uh, the government had not taken a proactive role in protecting these minorities. This morning there was another attack and tens of people have died. And I would like to know why the government is not taking action to prevent this from happening because this seems to be one of those acts of terrorism that are going to have a massive implication towards, uh, to the American and Pakistani relationship because LEJ, the terrorist group that is orchestrating these uh, massive killings, is actually affiliated in some ways with the Al-Qaeda. So what is the government doing and why hasn't it been done uh, sooner? Thank, Thank you, you very much. This is, uh, a very, this is the core of some of the problems and challenges that we face. It is an important question and I'm very glad you asked of it. It's important to me personally and to my government, uh, which has treated this uh, act of senseless murder as quite unconscionable and unacceptable. Uh, it is not for us a function, uh, it, it is not heinous or uh, condemnable or terrible because it may affect the Pakistan-US relationship. It for us is uh, it poses a clear and present danger to us uh, and how we see um, how we seek to protect our citizens so really um, if our citizens are uh, are unempowered or are in danger it is the state's responsibility to protect and we are and I'd let me inform you today I, I know what the Chief Justice has said a um, couple of steps have been taken. The last time this happened, the entire provincial government of Balochistan was dismissed um, in 48 hours. The Prime Minister today now has taken further action. He has sent an, a huge parliamentary team to go there and see what they, ca what they can do to alleviate the wounds of these peoples. I would think the families are inconsolable but the state must act. But more importantly, uh, there has been an emergency meeting between the Prime Minister, the Chief of Army Staff, and uh, the President, who have put out, I don't know if you've seen this, they have said that there will be a targeted operation against all those responsible. But you know, here, herein, uh, clearly, I'm not able to articulate the challenge, the scope and nature and gravity of the challenge we face. I mean, Al-Qaeda is, as I said, a clear present danger to us. It is, an un it is the front lines of the enemy we are fighting. Uh, it is not a question of commitment. It is, uh, as our interlocutors in certainly the U.S. government have understood, because they are in the trenches with us sometimes in Afghanistan, at least on that border we are facing them, we have 150,000 soldiers standing at that border. Uh, and they are pretty much engaged in constant vigilance. Uh, I am, it is heartbreaking to know and hear that our citizens are victims, but we are losing soldiers and citizens by the day. Pakistan's story of commitment and resilience is quite unprecedented and I would uh, also seek some appreciation for that. We stand behind our governments, we stand behind the institutions we are building while we face off the surge of violence from the region. Hi, my name is Kamil Chima. I'm, I'm from Lahore and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, I personally, first of all, would like to congratulate you on uh, bringing an amendment to the blasphemy law uh, in the parliament. And I will feel absolutely, I will understand completely if you don't feel comfortable answering this question. And I also want to, as a private citizen, um, offer solidarity with you for, since you've been accused of this, in my opinion, most heinous law, most barbaric law. Uh, Khalil Gibran said um, that pity the nation that raises not its voice, save when it walks in a funeral. Do you see an amendment to this law? Do you see a change in this law? Do you see a repeal in this law? 
or do we have to wait for another Salman Tasir, another assassination, another funeral? Well, I think that I can only speak to this as a parliamentarian. I have been one for a time. I think that there is a consensus in Pakistani society to protect citizens and to further empower all levels of moderation and progressive uh, versions of this law that we are talking about. But uh, I really can't speak to this beyond that. Uh, we as citizens offer up whatever we can and we will continue to do so. Hi, <clears throat> Hi. Uh, I'm Sarmat Palijo. Uh, I'm a Mason Fellow mid-career at the Kennedy School. Uh, we welcome you here. We're very, very happy that you're here and your remarks were wonderful. I feel like Pakistan is one of the most misunderstood countries uh, uh, here at HKS uh, through my uh, many interactions with fellow students and they have a lot of questions and I, I, I hope you have answered some of them. Uh, my question is about women in Pakistan. Um, you are a great symbol, so is uh, Madam Fahmida Mirza and uh, Bilki Sidi and so many, uh, Mahatma Shahid uh, bin Azir Bhutto, but uh, if we keep fighting this war and terror and keep worrying about all these imminent dangers and we don't focus on women, um, we'll be net losers. I, mean, I know, I know uh, this government has done a lot of things to bring women forward, forward, but I feel like there's so much more to be done. Do you see any hope about uh, women empowerment in Pakistan? Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And I don't think that um, one uh, project takes so much of our attention away from the other. Um, I, I have to say that even in terms of record, our government has and this parliament particularly, including uh, private members from both sides of the benches, have initiated and executed more policy for empowering and protecting women than any other parliament in the history of Pakistan. And I'm happy to say that some of it is actually now uh, becoming implementable. Sometimes we pass laws uh, and passing those laws is important because they must first, as a first line of defense, have the protection of that law. But uh, we are doing pretty much moving on multiple fronts with women. There's a, um, several laws passed, including affirmative action, including, um, as you know, sexual harassment. There's a domestic violence law going into the Senate. I believe that the United States Senate just actually, after so many years, passed that law yesterday. So I think we're speeding fed. Uh, and uh, we are now also looking at, as I said, uh, all the social service programs. The first social safety net ever put out in the history of Pakistan is the Benazir Income Support Program. It is not, I repeat, not restricted to uh, parliamentarians from the ruling party. It goes through all constituents um, elected uh, once they're elected. And to the bottom of the pyramid, it is for the most vulnerable, and the way this is accounted for is that the World Bank is helping to conduct a poverty survey. Now, why I'm saying uh, that it reaches only women, only women householders are the recipients of this. What this does is it empowers the women of that household, they, the cash and the rewards from it, uh, including health benefits, um, and other, um, I think we have a few more programs up in the next, after the next election. Coming up, 18% of the population is already uh, res a recipient of this social transfer. This is a huge, huge, I call, you know, defeminization of poverty. A lot more needs to be done. I mean, it's not enough for, for you to say, or me to say that, okay, you know, I'm an ambassador and we have a foreign minister, uh, a prime minister, a speaker. Uh, we have many you know, women now in high places and they're you know, flying planes, they're in the military, they're taking charge um, and uh, even on the political front lines, even in the political parties, they have a seat at the table and that's very important that we are seeking to mainstream women and minorities. We cannot leave our minorities behind. So we're expanding the seats for them in parliament. We have done so this time. Uh, and really that is the crucible of decision making and leadership for all our communities. Just to take one last question. Yes, uh, I have to be going. Sure. Good evening, Ambassador Rahman. My name is Shijoni and I'm a student from India at the Kennedy School. Um, you alluded 
ANR comments on the role of Pakistan as commitment to the Afghan peace process. I was actually curious uh, to hear your thoughts, maybe in a private capacity, on what India's role should be in the Afghan peace process, and if there has to be a joint initiative between the US, Pakistan, and India, uh, who should take the lead? Well, I think right now uh, it's an Afghan-led process and it should continue to be an Afghan-led process. I don't think, I mean, while we, the neighbors and the, those that share a border with Afghanistan uh, are naturally uh, countries with immediate concern and obviously at, at immediate risk as well, uh, I can only just speak to Pakistan's calculus as far as uh, strategy in Afghanistan is concerned. As I said, it's changed. It is clearly uh, and unambiguously, unequivocally in support of Afghan solutions. This is why whenever we even have a visit to Afghanistan, high-level visit at pri prime minister level, president, foreign minister, any ministerial level, we try to ensure that all sides of the polit political spectrum are engaged. We do not want to be seen or um, acting as playing favorites in Afghanistan. That is not for us. And uh, therefore, uh, really, this is the time now for the international community that is already inside Afghanistan to be empowering, building institutions so that those gains that I spoke about can be protected and are not reversed. Uh, it, this is important for the Afghan people and they have to make those decisions about their future. I don't think anybody else can make them, and history, um, both uh, ancient as well as current, advises us that. So thank you for that. Uh, excuse me, I have a one important question I came from really far away. I need to ask her, if you don't mind. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sayyid Shah Roz Hussain. I'm the son of Sayyid Shaheed, Dr. Riaz Hussain Shah, who was killed a month ago in Peshawar. He was a PPP leader and media portrayed him as a PPP leader. But more than that, he was a Shia leader. <clears throat> he passed away and now my question is, once in 2014, when America pulls out of Pakistan, the tehreek e taliban lashkar e jangvi group will need a new front. Just like after the Cold War, the, the new front became Kashmir. Once in 2014, when America pulls out, they're going to come to Pakistan. And once they come to Pakistan, their main targets will be Shias. Not only Hazara Shias, but on all the other Shias, like my father. And you said that Pakistan is, ha the government has a consensus, consensus in providing security to us. But my father knocked every government door asking for security, and yet he was provided none. What will be your policies regarding that? Thank you. I am very, very sorry for your loss. Young man, I'm very, very sorry for your loss, and I don't think any words from a diplomat or government official can quite console you or your family or the future that was stolen from you. I think I've already spoken. I know you're angry. I understand that anger. I empathize with it, and I can see it resonating in the room. Uh, I look to a future where we can all protect, not just our Shias, but every single citizen of Pakistan. They are entitled to the same protections as anyone else. We have to ensure that while we are on the front lines of many great strategic changes, uh, innocent people don't get caught in the crosshairs of that conflict. This is what I have been speaking about all evening. And it is my failure if I have not been able to communicate that to you or my government. Uh, I think that we are looking towards, as I said, I've, I've voiced anxieties and apprehensions. Those are not mine alone. Let me just assure you of one thing. There is no lack of worry, empathy, or anxiety about what our communities are going through. We will be there. We will be in Pakistan, in the trenches, and in the front lines, whatever happens. So thank you. Let me uh, close this evening by thanking you very much for your time, your comments, and for speaking for many or maybe even all of us here and saying that we support and endorse your vision for a productive and strong Pakistan-US relationship. So thank you again for joining us. Please join me in thanking the ambassador.